Hello, uh, here's how to get an offer from EFDS at Imperial. Um, I got an offer this year in the 2025 UCAS cycle. Um, so yeah, let's get started, let's just get going. Uh, first things first, there's this video online, um, which is the same premise. Has a lot of views actually, it's the only one about it. But in actuality, from my own personal opinion, I would say to avoid this video, um, having got an offer myself, I don't agree with a lot of the stuff that the video said. And as well as that, they're trying to sell you a product, the props, they're trying to sell you some admissions consultancy. I'm not trying to sell you anything, I'm just trying to do it because I enjoy it, I do it for the love of the game. So keep that in mind, just be a bit careful, do not pay for their stuff or whatever. You can do this for completely free. I didn't pay for their stuff and I got an offer. Cool, um, first things first, the offer rate is not actually 5%. So a lot of people have this assumption that Imperial EFDS is extremely competitive, etc. It is, kind of, it's kind of misleading. So in actuality, the true offer rate. In the 2024 cohort, I looked at the data on Imperial's website, you go to the transparency bit. There were 98 offers for home applicants, so people from the UK, um, from 687 applicants, which gives a 14% offer rate for home applicants. The overall offer rate was 5.4%, but that's including internationals. So the key thing I want you to look at is the fact that there's a three times higher offer rate for domestics compared to internationals. So you're three times more likely to get an offer if you're a home student. Make sense? Cool. 2025, however, when I was at the open day, I noticed something different. There's quite a lot of people there. And I did some digging into the data. And thankfully, there's a link of photo. Um, you can see it on my Notion page. I took a photo of it. They told us how many people applied and how many the interviews there were. So 2,200 plus applications, 500 plus interviews. And then from there, I did some extrapolation. So I looked at how many offers were given each year. So I think the first year was like 188. The second year was like 230 or something like that. So extrapolating with the jumps, I'm assuming there's 260 offers this year. They might have increased by even more, but who knows. 12% offer rate this year um, overall, and the offer rate for home students is three times higher. We'd like to see a 36% offer rate. This is all kind of waffle. You can yap over it if you want, or you can skip over it. But um, yeah, TLDR is it's actually not that competitive, so don't do that. There's also uh, an above 50% post-interview conversion rate, just according to this, uh, which is like pretty easy. Cool. GCSE grades. So most off our holders have eight or nines. Um, there's quite a lot of students from private schools doing the course. Don't know why, but just just are. Um, and they care more about GCSEs in Oxbridge, I would say, based on all the data. Because most offer holders have eights and nines, whereas at uh, Oxbridge you can get more sevens and eights. Um, and nine in maths is really, really important just because the course is so mathematical. But context is also king. I have seen some students get in with seven, sevens and eights, um, but they tend to come from like disadvantaged areas, uh, a school which isn't that good. Um, maybe they're on free school meals, etc. So GCSEs seem to be quite important for Imperial. A-levels, um, A-star AA with an A-star in maths is like the mandatory requirement. A-star in maths is just, you need that. You need that, absolutely, you need that. Economics, most offer holders have economics. Um, an A-star in economics goes a long way. Uh, going on LinkedIn and just scrolling, scrolling through, most of them have an A-star in economics. So I'd say having an A-star in maths and A-star in economics is really, really useful. Further maths, however, is not at all mandatory. There were very, there's a large amount of students who just didn't have further maths, and that's completely okay, they have an offer. Um, further maths can help you, but you do not need it at all, compared to like LSE and Cambridge where you absolutely need it. Most off holders have four A levels, but that leads me to question whether it's correlation and causation. A lot of them came from private schools where doing four A levels is quite normal. You don't necessarily need four A levels, just a lot of them have it. Um, yeah, so maybe four A levels can give you an advantage, but we can't really identify if that's true or not. Um, the fourth A level tends to be history, politics, or computer science. I did history, a lot of them did comp computer science because economics, finance, data science, quite a computer science y thing. Um, and quite a few people, for whatever reason, had politics. Uh, maybe public policy, maybe because public policy is a big focus of the course, that can help. But yeah, that's like the A level stuff. The offer tends to be A star AA, but if you come from like a really good private school, they might give you a higher offer. Uh, there's also a lot of gap year students, weirdly. There's a lot of gap year students getting into the course. So I don't know, don't know why. Maybe they like to achieve grades more. Cool, personal statement is quite important for Imperial. Um, so I would say that with Cambridge, personal statement isn't that important, but with Imperial it is. And in particular, it's important because they like you to mention either finance or data science, even if it's just a bit. I'll show you in a minute how you can go about doing that. General rules for personal statement though, books are really important, avoid any basic books, don't do like poor economics. Uh, the most important thing within the books is talking about your opinion. So you could say like, oh, the author argued this, I agreed with this argument, or I disagreed with her argument. Um, just giving your opinion is the most important thing. You should snowball, so do first supercurricular, second supercurricular, third supercurricular. So I did the IEA internship, and then I read a book, and then I did an essay competition. That sort of thing showing deeper engagement. It should be almost completely academic. Um, LSE has really good guidance about personal statements this year, so it's useful. Have a theme throughout your personal statement. Imperial seems to really like that as well. So, for example, one theme could be um, the economics of developing countries, and then you could talk about that. Um, then finally, you should have a short introduction and a conclusion. Um, this is a bit weird. Um, this advice, yeah, it's a bit weird because the new format's a bit strange, but yeah. Cool, so there's a few different tick boxes which you have to have, which was on the Imperial website. Uh, this is all on my free Notion page, by the way. You can click it in the link in the description, which is a bit more organized. Um, there's basically tick boxes for what they want to see, um, evidence in your personal statement. So I'm going to go through how I satisfied each criteria to help you. So the first evidence 
thing that they wanted you to do. The first tick box was strong academic achievements. Um, I didn't want to put it in my personal statement itself, so instead I got my teacher reference to talk about my UKMT scores and also my A-level results since I'd already achieved my grades. So in maths, for example, I achieved 99% in both my pure papers, so I got my teacher to mention that. The next thing is you need to show evidence of being curious about evolving boundaries of research and professional practice in economics and or finance and or data science. Um, so that essentially means like being interested in research, um, like professional economics. So professional economics is a bit of a weird thing, but it's kind of like econometrics, kind of data, um, kind of digging deeper into human correlations and stuff like that. So the way that I went about doing this, can I zoom in? There we go. Um, I talked about uh, modern monetary theory, which is like pretty, pretty um, at the forefront right now. Modern monetary theory is just the idea of like being able to print money and the real constraint isn't budgets, but rather inflation. Um, I, I read a book, uh, Kelton, who's like, uh, Stephanie Kelton, really famous economist. I read her book about it. And then I looked into a research paper, so Lena 2023. So he essentially did like a job guarantee um, thing. Like they did, they did a trial. So I just looked at that. Um, and that's straight up research. That's like 2023, that's modern research. Uh, so yeah, that's why I satisfied that criteria. Whoa, sorry about that. Oh, whoa, there we go. The next thing is excited by problem solving and facing new challenges. That is a bit weird. I'll be so honest. It's difficult to show you excited by some problem solving. I suppose um, UKMT can help with that because that is problem solving. Um, but one of the ways that I showed it was talking about like modern questions that I had to do with the research. So I talked about drugs and economics in my personal statement. Um, and this bit I think was most important. I questioned how difficult it would be to determine a socially optimum prescription price, which minimizes fatalities while also remaining politically viable. That's like creative problem solving. So the general idea is how can we price drugs to make that um, as few people die as possible but also ensuring that the public doesn't hate it. Because a lot of times when you do anything to do with drugs, the public are gonna hate it, the voters. Cool, let's keep going. Oh my gosh, there we go. Passionate about applying quantitative tools and models to commercial and policy questions. So this is essentially just using quantitative tools, so like statistical analysis, stuff like that, and applying that to commercial and policy questions. So commercial is like maximizing money for a firm, maximizing profit, and policy is like public policies, like different government tools. Um, so I, once again, was the drug thing. Um, I did a multivariable calculus course, it was a paper, Mulligan 2022, used optimization to talk about like drugs, drug prices and stuff like that. So here I was applying calculus to a policy question of drugs. Nice. Uh, motivated engaged learners who work well independently with peers. It's kind of waffly because if you've got like four A stars, you're clearly motivated. But anyways, um, even if you've got like two A stars and A, you're clearly motivated. But alas, we still show it. So for motivation, I showed that through the fact that I completed the multivariable calculus course. Multivariable calculus is very difficult. Um, it's like undergraduate level stuff. Um, and I did that on my own accord. So that shows I'm motivated. And then with peers, I talked about a reading group discussion I did. So a reading group discussion is essentially like a few of my friends coming together after school, whatever, and just talking about a book and talking about ideas. So that shows I work well with, in, in a group. And that's especially important for the Imperial course because there's a lot of group work involved. That's what kind of differentiates the Imperial course. There's a lot of group work, there's a lot of presenting and stuff like that. Very much a teamwork based course. So they like to see that. Cool, strong communicators, that's the next thing. Uh, so there's two types of communication that I can see. Communication in terms of writing and communication in terms of like verbal. So just in terms of writing, just write your personal statement well. Uh, use short sentences. There's a few like, rules on being a good writer. Ask ChatGPT maybe on how to be a good writer. George Orwell has a really good um, article about it too. Um, but yeah, write, my writing is good. That helped me with strong communication. And as well as that, group discussion leads. So I talked about the reading group discussion. Uh, the fact that I was leading in group discussion shows that like, I'm, I'm quite competent with it, etc. So that shows that I'm a strong communi communicator. Bosh. Um, there we go. Be unique. So this is a bit of a difficult, a difficult one. I can't lie. You could be unique through your ideas. Um, so I, I guess the drug stuff was pretty unique. I don't think anyone else is going to talk about that. Um, but as well as that, you could be unique through like other things you've done. So I was unique by talking about um, the award that I won for the prime minister for all my work that I've done in education. And as well as that, I taught further maths and economics at my school during my gap year, which I think is quite a unique thing to do. Cool. So those were all of the bullet points, I think. Uh, yeah, there we go. So one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven. If you satisfy then your satisfy those bullet points in your personal statement, you're in a really, really, really good position. Um, sorry, I just woke up, which is why I'm like yapping so much, but I wanted to get the video out ASAP. Cool. Here's my entire personal statement. I'll scroll down. Oh, shit. There we go. You can just screenshot that if you want. Uh, but yeah, that's my personal statement. It's, it's quite like sweaty. I put a lot of time into it, but don't do that. Cool. Tamura, Tamura, Tamura. Okay, this is such a big thing, right? A lot of people are like, what score do I need to get in Tamura? I'll tell you. The Tamura barely matters. What the hell? I know. The Tamura this year, I saw people, offer holders, with getting, getting a three, four, five, even if they're from private schools. There's a bloke who I met from Scotland, sound bloke, I wonder if he's watching this video. He got, I think, a 4.2 in the Tamura, right? He got a 4.2 in the Tamura, and he was from like a really fancy private school. He got an offer. Um, so yeah, the Tamura really doesn't matter. Well, in our year, it didn't matter for whatever reason. I want to say it'll matter more next year. 
maybe because it was the first year, to me it didn't matter that much. Um, a 4.0 flat, a plus, will put you in a good position based on like all the conversations I've had. 5.0 plus is ideal, especially for Cambridge um, and LSE. But as long as you've got a four, you're like proper calm. Like it's really weird. Contextual also helps a lot. There's someone on Reddit who got him with a 1.0. I'm not even joking. I saw that. Like, I think the post did really well because obviously it's quite ridiculous. And it was like, it was serious. Um, yeah, talking to a lot of people, I had people who had 3.0s. I had people 3.2, stuff like that. I got 5.4 and I was on the higher end. There were some people who had insanely good Tamuas. Um, but yeah, not that deep. Tamuas, like, not that deep. In terms of preparation, I have a separate video with a guy who got a 9.0. So watch that if you want to prepare. If you should prepare. Okay, interview. This is shrouded in a mystery, and this is what really pisses me off. Because when I went to the off the day, a lot, the reason why I'm making this video in particular, the people who got in, in the most recent year, all of them knew someone who was currently doing the course. And they provided them with a huge advantage, because they knew what the questions were going to be. And that really upset me, because that's just like straight up inequality, do you know what I mean? So, I want to try and level the playing field as much as I can, by making more information available. So, the, the interview seems to hold uh, mid-importance. I showed you data earlier. I think it's about 50% conversion rate this year. Um, it will probably be more difficult in the next few years. There's three things that come up in the interview. Firstly, there's a motivational question to start. Um, the motivational question can be something like, why EFDS, why Imperial, which of EFDS is most important? So that's like the first thing, okay? Um, I'll talk to you in a minute about how to answer it well. The second thing is data science slash econometrics case study. So it's usually co correlation versus causation, something to do with the reverse causal nexus, identify causality. So essentially just one thing cause another. And that's really big in economics, right? We're trying to always identify causality. Uh, so yeah, econometric stuff. They might give you a case study about something random. Um, a few years ago on a YouTube video, apparently it was something to do with coffee that they did, correlation and causation to do with coffee. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then finally, game theory. They usually do a bit of game theory. Um, it's not necessarily always the case that they do game theory. Like sometimes I might do one motivation question or two motivation questions even, and then just the data science case study or just game theory. So keep that in mind, but it's obviously good to prepare for. For the game theory, um, yeah, they usually do like a basic game. So for example, ice cream on a beach, and then they adapt it. So for example, ice cream on a beach, but they adapt it to like the political spectrum or something cool like that. Um, yeah, so game theory is a bit annoying, but yeah. In terms of how to prepare, motivation questions. I would say memorize three points for each question. So for why EFDS, I'll be like, okay, um, it combines economics and data science, which is good because you can identify causality. Um, I actually yapped for too long in my answer, I remember. So don't yap too, too much, but just memorize three points. Just make sure they're not BS, like, oh, Imperial is the best university in the world or whatever. Uh, they're probably like that, to be fair, but I would personally not do that. I'd say something a bit more specific, like these opportunities are good, um, the location is good, etc. For data science slash econometrics, I would strongly recommend using ChatGPT to learn about the reverse causal nexus, testing causality, and the things I mentioned earlier, like correlation and causation. You can even potentially use it to create practice questions for you, uh, which might be a good idea. And then finally, game theory. YouTube, there's tons of videos. There's a TEDx video about the beach problem, which is useful to watch. Uh, ChatGPT, you can use that to learn the basic games and memorize their solutions. So I have flashcards going through each of the basic games and their solutions. Um, and then finally, you should learn backwards induction, just in case a game comes up which you haven't come across, because backwards induction can help you solve the problem. Cool. TLDR, okay, we've come to the end of the video. The 5% offer rate is bullshit. Um, yeah, pretty much. Like, if you're an international student, then you're cooked. Um, but I think a lot of international students apply to the course just because they feel like it's easier to get in because it's only A star AA. So maybe there's a bit to do that. But basically, if you're a home applicant, you're calm. You're actually so calm. Like it's, all my friends who applied, except one, got an offer. And I had a lot of friends apply. So take that grain of salt. GCSEs, mostly eights eight and nines are good. Um, sevens if, you, if you're disadvantaged or if you face some sort of disadvantage. Um, yeah. A levels, A star AA with A star maths is like pretty much the baseline, um, but econ is helpful and further, further maths is nice if you don't need it, but econ is really helpful. Um, I would say I, I'd probably put money on someone with A star, A star A getting in. A star AA, maybe if they're disadvantaged, um, yeah. Personal statement matters, I did just mention a little bit of finance or data science. Oh yeah, uh, if I go back to my personal statement, I mentioned data science over here. It's very simple, but I said LSE Springboard introduced me to price theory as a data-driven approach to economic analysis. So I just kind of bullshit and said this entire thing was about data, when it really isn't, but yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, the Tamu isn't that deep at the moment. It'll probably matter more in your year, so 4.0 minimum plus. Um, obviously for other universities, Tamu matters a lot, so lock in for the Tamu. And then finally, the interview also doesn't seem to matter that much. Like, according to the data, all the way over here, blah, 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 there we go, the two offering. There was 500 plus interviews on the photo that they showed us on the PowerPoint presentation. And I'm assuming they're giving around 260 offers, which is over 50% like conversion rate, which is really stupid. Like what's the point in an interview if it's 50% conversion rate? Um, just a bit of a drag for them. But anyways, yeah, that's everything. Uh, if you have any questions, let, them, let me know in the comments. Um, quite a few of my friends have got offers as well. So I'll try and get them to like respond or like give me information that I don't have. Otherwise, um, thank you very much. Hopefully this does a bit in leveling the playing field. I want more people who know no one doing the course actually getting offers because it does seem like a really, really good course. 
Um, and I think you'll have a lot of fun at Imperial. Very interesting place to be. Very interesting. Uh, make sure to shower if you get an offer. Much love. Good luck, guys. You got this. Thank you.